Hello and welcome to P's and G's online this morning. Wherever you're joining us, um, it's just a pleasure to have you worshipping with us today. I'm Fleur and I'm the student worker here at P's and G's. And we believe here that when two or more are gathered in Jesus' name, then God is there among them. So even if you're kind of joining us virtually from halfway across the world, um, let's just be united in what God is doing today. So today we'll be continuing our series in 2 Corinthians, um, the first part of which is often referred to as the letter of tears. And maybe that's something that resonates with you this morning. We've been through a really difficult couple of years. And even as we begin to ease out of restrictions, certainly in the UK anyway, we're still dealing with the long term implications of what the pandemic has meant. And maybe that's left you pretty unsettled today. Maybe there are things going on relationally for you, or maybe internally in your own private life. Today, we're kind of grappling with that paradox of being a Christian, that we simultaneously have the death of Jesus residing in our bodies, but also, as Romans tells us, that we also have the same power that rose Jesus from the dead alive in us. So today we're just going to look a little bit at that um, and try and find God in the tough times that we might be experiencing. But before we go into worship, why don't I just pray for us right now? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the light that you give to all situations. We thank you that you are a God who journeys with us through all of the ups and downs of our lives. We thank you, God, that even when things might be really, really difficult for us right now, perhaps the hardest they've been in our lives, that actually we can still come back to you, that we can hold on to the hope that we have in Jesus and in what he has done for us. We pray this morning that you would be speaking gently to us, whatever we're facing right now. In Jesus' name, amen. God from whom all blessing flows. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above you heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death Your perfect love is casting out fear And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back, I know you are near For I will fear no evil For my God is with me And if my God is with me Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? go through the calm and through the storm oh no never let go in every high and every low oh no never let go won't you never let go of me cause I can see the light that is coming for the heart that holds on glorious light beyond the good Troubles, but until that day comes, I live to know you here on the earth, and I will fear no evil, for my God is with me, and if my God is with me, whom then shall I? just great to worship together this morning. So now we're going to have our reading from Rachel and then afterwards Dave is going to speak to us. Our reading today is from 2 Corinthians 6 verses 3 to 13. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather as servants of God we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships and distresses in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonour, bad report and good report, 
genuine yet regarded as imposters, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children. Open wide your hearts also. Amen. Well, today we continue our series looking through this letter of Paul to the church in Corinth. Um, it's the second or third one that he wrote. Second Corinthians is what it's called in our Bibles. When I got COVID just before Christmas, one of the things I did was watch a lot of television. And when I say a lot, it was a lot. And I discovered Afterlife by Ricky Gervais on Netflix. It's been incredibly popular. Even before the launch of the third series last month in January, it had had over 100 million views worldwide. It's the story of Tony, played by Ricky Gervais, a man whose wife has died from cancer and his journey through grief and bereavement. At times, quite shockingly crude, it's also remarkably poignant, beautiful, profound and deeply moving. I think I wept at some point in most episodes. Following a personal bereavement, Ricky Gervais himself did go to see a counsellor and he remembered what they said to him. He recalled they said something like, grief is like a heavy rucksack. It doesn't get lighter, but you get better at carrying it. Suffering, pain, grief and death continue to perplex many people. And as Christians, we're not immune from any of it. We may believe passionately in life after death, and I would love a coffee or a pint with Ricky Gervais to explain why, but it does not diminish the sadness of bereavement, the anger at sickness, or the questions that suffering can pose. And again, if you want to help, uh, to be helped thinking about through these questions, can I recommend Tim Keller's book, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. It's a really helpful book and written from a personal perspective as well as a theological one, as Keller himself was diagnosed with lung cancer in 2013 and pancreatic cancer in 2020. And it's striking that in 2 Corinthians, suffering is one of the things that the Apostle Paul focuses on. New teachers had seemingly arrived in Corinth after Paul himself had left, and they'd presented a triumphalistic and powerful image of Christian leadership, ministry and discipleship. For them, following Jesus meant life would go well, success would be guaranteed, blessing was a sign of God's favour, suffering on the other hand was a sign of sin, God's judgment and distance. These new teachers boasted of their achievements, their accomplishments and their successes, as many leaders down the centuries had done in churches, charities and companies. And remember, people in Corinth and across the Greek and Roman world held certain values very highly. Firstly, a rugged individualism that valued self-sufficiently, self-sufficiency, money as the key to status and influence. Thirdly, the need to constantly boast of your achievements and possessions. Fourthly, a competition for recognition that viewed boasting as the natural way to behave. And fifthly and finally, a pride in where you lived as showing your place and value and worth in society. Values that, if we're honest, are still very familiar today. By contrast, and in establishing his credentials, Paul focuses on one thing and it's not what they're expecting. He doesn't focus on his achievements or the churches that he's planted. He doesn't mention his impeccable Jewish heritage or educational qualifications. He does that elsewhere in Philippians 3 and verse 5. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee. But not here. He explicitly says in chapter 5 and verse 12 of 2 Corinthians, we are not trying to commend ourselves again to you. But what he focuses on is one thing, how much he too has suffered. 
There are four lists of how Paul has suffered as a Christian in 2 Corinthians alone. Chapter 1, verses 8 to 10, chapter 4, verses 7 to 12, this list in chapter 6, and chapter 11, verses 23 to 29. And in this list, in chapter 6, verses 3 to 10, Paul relates several things that he's learned about suffering. Firstly, verse 3, you need to walk the talk. Paul knows that there should be no credibility gap for him as a Christian leader. He can't say one thing and do another. He recognises people will doubt and have questions. Paul himself did, even Jesus did in Gethsemane. But Paul also knows that a leader cannot say one thing and do another. Integrity, who you are when no one's looking, matters. Secondly, never underestimate the power of simply turning up verse 4. The words in great endurance almost are like a banner over the list that follows. Paul has learned the power of stickability, of simply keeping going, that following Jesus is a marathon, not a sprint. Again, I was struck this week by the revelation that I read before Christmas, that patience was the quality that sustained the early church and enabled it to thrive, not just survive, for 300 years before it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. As Christians were martyred in Colosseums and cared for plague and leprosy sufferers. As Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, observed, the outsiders looked at the Christians and saw them energetically feeding poor people caring for boys and girls who lacked property and parents, and being attentive to aged slaves and prisoners. Christianity's truth was visible. It was embodied and enact enacted by its members. And then thirdly, Paul lists three sets of troubles in verse 4. Troubles, hardships and distresses. The word troubles or afflictions, the Greek word thlipsis, occurs 45 times in the New Testament, but it occurs more in 2 Corinthians than anywhere else. It refers to the pressures and anxieties of normal life, illness, bereavement, unemployment. The second word, the word for hardships, ananke, referred to things like torture or pain, in Paul's case, beatings, riot and prison. The third word, distresses, stenocria, had the sense of being cornered or perplexed. For Paul, it came about through hard work, sleepless nights and hunger. You see, for Paul, following the suffering servant meant that he would serve and suffer. It was part of the job description. So how did he keep going? Well, the clue comes in verses 7 to 10. The fruit and power of the Spirit. It's an amazing and poetic list. Some fruit of the Spirit, as the character of Jesus, was reproduced in Paul. And then the power of the Spirit, as the person and works of Jesus, were re reproduced in Paul, irrespective of the context or circumstances. Paul trusted God to work, to sustain and to strengthen him, in good times or bad times, rejoicing or weeping, and that gave him the great endurance that he talked about. So how are we doing today? Would the phrase great endurance describe how we're doing? Are we willing to keep trusting God, even in the face of suffering, even in the t face of difficulties and hardships, in the face perhaps of a bleak medical diagnosis? If we feel cornered or confused, if we think people are gossiping about us, if we're on the edge of giving up? Are we content to surrender control of our lives and deaths to God? I heard a lovely story this week that was a great illustration of what Paul had learned, but also countless Christians down the centuries have also experienced. A Peace and G's church member has a terminal cancer diagnosis. They'd heard this week through an email that we sent out that the Alpha Course was having its Holy Spirit Day this weekend. They prayed, this particular person, and listened to what they sensed God was saying for some of the guests on the Alpha Course this weekend. 
They sent an email in sharing several things that they felt God was saying for individual guests and asked that they be passed on to the people who were attending the Alpha Course weekend. Here was somebody who is facing certain death, in great sadness and great pain often, but also with a deep sense of peace and trust in what life after death will hold for them. And even at the end of their life, they're still trusting in God, still listening to God, still serving even as they suffer and face death itself. This member of P's and G's knows the truth of what Paul writes about here in 2 Corinthians. My prayer is that each one of us may know the same truth in the same depth, even when times are tough. Let's pray. Father, thank you for just this amazing testimony that Paul is able to share with the church in Corinth. That even though he had known horrendous suffering and pain, persecution and all sorts of difficulties and hardships, yet he was still willing to trust you and to surrender his life and his death to your control. Thank you for the testimony, even this week, of a member of our church who is willing to do the same. And we pray that no matter how we're feeling today, you might give us the strength to hold on to you, to know that you can be relied upon, to know that you can be trusted, and that even though you may seem distant, even though things may seem bleak, that we might know your peace, that we might know your power, that we might know your love holding on to us, even when we're tempted to let go of you. Lord, give us that great endurance that the Apostle Paul had, that this particular church member has experienced, even in times of great weakness and pain. May we know that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. In Jesus' name, amen.
chases me down, fights till I'm fine, leaves the nine tonight. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. You're a fool, steal your love far from me. You are being so, so good to me. When I feel no word, you gave it all for me. You are being so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God It chases me down, fights till I found these nine tonight I couldn't earn it, I can serve it Will you give yourself away? Thank you so much for joining with us this morning. Um, it's just been great to be able to dig more into this passage together. And we'll just be praying that as you go into this week, uh, that you will be able to hold on to that hope, that hope of being a Christian, whatever you might be facing. 
So why don't we just pray together just as we finish up. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you can hold us in any situation. We thank you that you are a light in the darkness, that we can come to you with our questions and our doubts, that we can come to you when things don't make sense at all, Lord. We thank you for those biblical examples. For instance, in the book of Job, when he does come to you, he questions with you when he grapples with you. And thank you that there is comfort in being able to be real, to bring all parts of ourself to you. We pray, Lord, that you would be guiding us and directing us by your Holy Spirit, that we would be attentive to the nudgings of your spirit as we go through this week. Help us to show other people who you are by our words and actions. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. Mm-hmm.